Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me again today. I believe this is our 13th town hall um, since we all started to adhere to what was a shelter in place advisory as this pandemic has hit our, our, our community, our country, our world. Um, for those of you who've been tuning in, I, I hope this continues to be a place where you are finding helpful information and giving you the opportunity to ask experts right here locally and statewide about how to make sense of our lives through the lenses of this pandemic. Um, today's topic is one um, that I know lots of adults are struggling with, and that is really about understanding what are the impacts and the mental health impacts on our, on our lives and also on um, our children. For those of you who have lost loved ones um, due to this virus or just lost, lost loved ones during this time, um, my, my heart goes out to you. Um, grieving is, is always a, a, a painful journey, but grieving through a pandemic, I think, has been even more challenging because we don't get to do this together. Um, and so for those of you who are also doing your part, you're wearing your masks, you're keeping your distance, you are the reason why Massachusetts and Cambridge in particular has gone down to have one of the lowest rates of spread of infection. So I want to say thank you. Thank you for loving your community and your neighbors and your essential care workers and your grocery store workers. Thank you for loving um, each other and really keeping us all safe. Um, to the members on um, this panel today, I want to thank you. All of you um, do really some of the most important work that we can do, and, and that is for caring for the hearts, the souls, and the minds of children and, and those who love them and, and do their best to also take care of them. Um, I have had lots of parents reach out to me saying, you know, what should I do? What, how can I get my kid off a video game? And I'm going, I don't know. I'm a nine and 11 year old. I, I too am desperately trying to do this. And I think part of this is somebody said, um, we are trying to build a plane while flying it. And I thought, oh, was that you, Alice? <laughs> Actually, it might have been you. <laughs> yeah, see, lots of my wisdom comes from, from Alice Cohen. So um, I try to credit her when I can remember. Um, so today I have with me, I, I want to introduce, I have, I'll start with Alice Cohen. Alice Cohen is our lead teacher for social emotional learning for the Cambridge Public Schools. Um, Alice joins us with a long history of working with children um, and adults for, um, and, and, and the last 10 years through the city of Cambridge and now with the school department. So I want to thank Alice for being with us. We also have um, Mary McGowan, who is the executive director of the Massachusetts Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. Um, and also I believe is the leads the children's mental health campaign in Massachusetts and has um, decades experience really drilling down and focusing on how do we ensure that our children's well-being is being uplifted and supported by a lot of different stakeholders who have a role to play in this. So thank you, um, especially for that work. And as a chair of the Committee on Mental Health and Substance Use, I have had the incredible privilege of learning more about that. So thank you. I also want to say a special thank you to Dr. Meredith Gans Gansner, sorry, who is here with us as well from the Cambridge Health Alliance. Um, she is the uh, child and adolescent psychiatrist an instructor of psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School. And um, I wanna thank you for all of the work you do in the community and thank you for taking time out of your probably really, really busy schedule, um, given that this pandemic certainly has seen an increase in the rise of needs of our young children's well-being. So with that said, um, I'm gonna start with a question and I'll ask all of you to chime in um, and um, please, uh, for those of you who are watching this, if you're on Zoom, please feel free to email us questions. We're going to do our best to get to all of your questions. And if we somehow miss your question, please feel free to email me and I will do my best to get information to you um, after this as well. So the, the first question I'm looking at are, what are the best strategies to talk with young children about what is going on in the world from a deadly pandemic to police violence? Um, there's a lot happening in our world. There's a lot of unrest and uncertainty. And um, so I think that's the first question. There's a couple more after that. But uh, I, those, those are really big questions. And these things are colliding and in some ways offering an opportunity to collectively help empower children think about how they will change their world. But Alice, I'll ask you, you want to start? Sadly, at the time, time when we are required to be the most creative and inventive, we feel we have the fewest resources. So yes, we have a wonderful opportunity on our hands, but 
But the most important thing that we can do right now is to maintain our relationships with our kids. And I'm going to suggest quickly this very quick model for having this conversation with any age kid. It's called the SHARE model. And I'm going to email it so you can send it out. And the SHARE model is a structured way of processing information in a developmentally appropriate way. Sometimes as adults, we assume our kids know a lot more than they do. And so the SHARE model allows us to, to let kids ask us questions. And kids will ask generally just about what they want to know about. They don't go, they don't tend to go too much farther than that. So we're asking them to say what they saw and heard. We're asking them to look for the people who are helping because Mr. Rogers was right. We're asking them to affectively relate. What does it feel like when you see this? What does it feel like when you hear this? We're asking them to think if they're older kids about who's responsible, because older kids really like to know that there's somebody responsible. And if they're younger kids, we're talking about, you know, what, what contribution could we make? And then the E stands for efficacy, which is, okay, we know all this. What can we do? Do we put a sign in our yard? Do we do favors for each other? Do we have a rule in our house that there's a requirement for five random acts of kindness a day? I think we should continue to check in with our children, no matter what their age is. And we shouldn't do it in a formal way. We should try to catch them, try to catch them doing something right and say, I love it when this happens. What's going on right now? And, and then invite them. Simply invite them and say, you know, what, what are you thinking about these days? Like, are you reading stuff? Are you hearing stuff? What does it sound like to you? Because once we know the perspective our child has, we can give them missing pieces of information or we can correct them if they're, you know, if they don't quite have it right. So little kids, you know, they, if you're watching the news with them, which I don't recommend, they see everything, they think it's happening again. So after 9-11, when I worked at Manville School, many kids came in and said that thousands of planes had knocked down thousands of buildings because every time they saw this footage, they thought it was new. So it randomly, in the parentheses, I'm saying, please don't watch the news with little kids. Please don't. Okay, I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> Sorry. Alice, I could listen to you all day long um, while ignoring my kids. Um, <laughs> Can you, Alice, also, I, I introduced everybody a little bit. Do you want to say anything more about who you are in the world and your relationship to your experience? I'm a social worker, but I'm also a Cambridge public school parent. I have a 12-year-old and a 16-year-old, so a rising 7th grader and a 10th grader, rising 11th grader. This has been a huge challenge, stress-wise, to function, and I think everybody should recognize that these are tough times. And I want to explain why for just a second. The brain is not used to being in a state of constant arousal or anxiety. And so as the brain is processing these feelings of uncertainty and anxiety and horror and violence, the part of the brain that processes feelings in the middle of the brain gets overactivated. And when this part of the brain is overactivated, it distracts you and it impacts your executive function. So that's why you start doing something in your house and walk away from it and then come back and say, oh my God, the dishwasher. And that's why you have laundry in the washing machine and the dryer's empty, but nothing happened. And that's why if you have kids, they're, they're not picking up after themselves in the way that you might expect. <laughs> and it's hard. And so I think we have to recognize that our brains are stressed and we need extra special care right now. All of us need extra special care. Thank I, uh, okay, yeah. All right, uh, thank you. So I will go to Dr. Um, Meredith, can you say your name last name so I get it right? Sure, sure. it's Gansner. Gansner, okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Gansner, do you wanna maybe also, you know, respond to some of this and tell us a little bit more about your work? Um, sure. What are you, you know, what are you seeing as some of the um, concerns parents are bringing to you or some of the kids, what are they bringing to you? And, what is the what are some of the the go to strategies that you've had for helping kids and parents make sense of um, of all of this at a time that's really it doesn't make sense. Sure. So um, let me just say that as a I'm an inpatient child psychiatrist. Uh, so my work clinically is at Cambridge Hospital on the child unit there and the adolescent unit there, um, and that has been. I think some of the most challenging work that I've experienced over the last several months, 
um, because in addition to all kids being very stressed out, we had a lot of kids with very incredibly challenging needs who were very, very stressed out and then stuck in a hospital for a long period of time. And so um, it was an incredible experience working with kids who were almost kind of trapped in a silo inside the hospital, watching the world kind of descend into chaos around them and then trying to figure out how to work with children around that. Um, and then conversely, I actually do research in the afternoons and my area of research uh, is a research fellowship in digital media and in particular digital media and impact of screen use on kids who have existing mental health issues. So that has also been incredibly interesting because while the research itself has sort of stopped uh, because most of my work was with outpatient kids who aren't really um, in the clinics as much anymore. Um, but we're now seeing kids who are on screens all the time and it's now becoming even more of an issue. So um, it's been a very fascinating and um, very, I guess, just challenging for everybody, but especially challenging the last, the last several months in both my research and my uh, clinical work. Um, I will say, you know, um, I think that model, the share model works perfectly in trying to have kids feel like they have a safe space to talk. Um, I obviously see a subset of children who um, are more traumatized, I think, than most. And on top of that are also usually from communities that have been particularly traumatized by this pandemic and then as well by um, systemic racism. And so they're really trying to figure out what is going on um, while kind of, um, Alice, as you said, like everything in their bodies is kind of raging and can't process. And they tend to only be able to take in very, very tiny bits of information at a time. Um, and so we've really just been trying to find um, kind of just concrete periods to say like, let's check in, um, let's just use this as a space to talk. And you know, the great thing about an inpatient environment is that there is a forum for them to be expressing and exploring some of this with other people. And I think that that's incredibly important even outside of the hospital unit um, where they can, with their peers, just talk about what they've been hearing, what they've been learning. Um, and you know, on top of that, we know a lot of kids now, what they get from screen media, which they're gonna be naturally on all the time now anyway. And then with all this news, they're going to be even more so on screen media is um, some of that they find out later is, is completely false. We know, you know fake news does exist um, and, especially if one is very stressed out, you can take news that's real and then misinterpret it. And so it's, I think all the more important to just have these frequent check-ins, just understanding what it is that they saw, what they thought they saw, um, having a, a safe space just to share that and you know, not pushing too much or pressuring too much if it seems like it's just too much in that instant um, and being able to kind of share that with others who are maybe experiencing and feeling the same thing. So before I get to Mary, I guess one of the questions is right here that maybe you'd be the person to answer this, you know, and I, I'm getting this question from parents. I have this question as a parent and I'm reading it right here is how much is too much screen time in a pandemic? And I'll tell you one of the challenges that we have is um, I'm going to generalize and this is not true. You, you know, there's, you know, you know, gender does not drive this, but I see that with my male child, it is the way he tends to be able to have the most kind of um, communication with friends. We're just slowly opening up his world so he can actually find a way to safely from a distance play a game of ball. Um, but for most of this time, it really has been, if he's not on a screen, then he has no social communication. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's upsetting. And, and But this is true for lots of kids who's who, girls and boys and um, who parents are stressed out. How do they know it's too much? And it's not just a week of vacation on screen time. We're talking now like four months. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's something that kids who are already struggling with anxiety and depression, we're finding now all the more they get very glued to their screens. Um, but I think the basic principles that have been offered kind of as guidance from the American Academy of Pediatrics sort of still hold just in terms of kind of quality of use. Um, a lot of the studies have suggested active use, so communication with others, Skyping with family, friends, or I guess FaceTiming, whatever modality you want to use. Um, that's all good and should be encouraged. And in screen time with that, there really are no set limits. Um, it's the passive use that we really want to be aware of. And I think in particular in my field, that's what I look out for. Because Talk more about what that yeah. means. The passive use is one, basically when one is on the screen, just kind of doing an activity that... Um, 
is just taking it in, taking it in. It's like just watching the world go on around you, watching YouTube videos kind of on repeat, um, scrolling through comments on social media, just one after the other, that sort of thing. Um, gaming is is a bit of a separate issue, although there is it depends on the type of game and that can get very detailed and complicated for sure. But but to some extent to uh, gaming and passive use um, when you're not engaging with others, they, it's a way that lots of kids are choosing to cope with all these feelings they're having right now, and especially when they don't know what to do with those feelings. And so the easiest thing to do, and I mean, I'm guilty of this myself, having a small child who it should be in daycare and isn't, and I have to work, my husband has to work, um, putting her in front of the television and saying like, okay, let's try and watch this educational program for a while. Um, but then we're not getting to engage with her surrounding what her thoughts are, what her worries are, why her friends suddenly aren't there anymore. Um, and so the kids just automatically they don't know how to deal but passive use helps them distract helps them kind of say okay I don't have to think about this I don't have to talk about this I'm just going to deal with how I'm feeling by just watching this and it kind of disappears and that is really really addictive and I don't mean that in the kind of formal sense of addiction but just in terms of helping one just feel better it's a coping skill but it's a coping skill that's very challenging to get rid of if one does it for hours and hours on end um, and but that's what I understand parents right now we're, we're all trying to work while our kids are trying to just get through the day while learning. And so I, I think one can't necessarily beat up on oneself about saying, oh, my kid had like two hours and that, you know, well, this, this media time and I didn't want them to have more two than two hours would be an accomplishment. <laughs> you know, and actually that two hours is the got like the appropriate recommended amount per day, but it's it's impossible at this at this stage to have only two hours. And I think we have to, as parents or as people who love children and are working to support children, just understand that that's just it's a challenge right now. And even with distance learning, that was going to be impossible. Um, but just I think that's where the check-ins, the repeated check-ins become really helpful because it's just a, a, a way to break up that monotony and just kind of check in on the feelings that are there that are fueling that ongoing use. Um, and that's where we also find you know, structured, really like painfully structured scheduling of a day can be helpful too. It's just so there's a, there's a breakup between these just hours of kind of trying to cope by watching screens. Um, but I would always say that social connections through kind of actively using screens, I think that's all we have right now. So we, can, we have to go for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and Mary McGowan, thank you for joining us as well. And I would love to hear more from you about, you know, what are the strategies that you're seeing? Um, what are the needs that you are hearing from organizations and from parents around the state? And um, what are the concerns? You know, you work for an organization that really is about eyes on the well-being of children. And one of the things that I've been talking about in my work as a chair oh, was the number of uh, so mandatory reporters who are who are gone, right? And struggling with what, what it means to re-envision a mandatory reporting. And, and that has its own pitfalls and challenges, right? So um, I'd love to hear sort of, you know, what you're hearing and what you're seeing. And, and right now, what's the advice that you're giving to um, parents and caregivers? Sure. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much um, for inviting me to be here. And, and thank you um, for your unrivaled commitment and engagement um, on this issue, um, not only as chair of the committee, but long before that. Uh, we are very, very lucky to have you as a champion. So thank you very much for all of your work. Um, again, I'm Mary McCown. I'm the executive director of MSPCC, the Massachusetts Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. And it's a mouthful, but um, we really do say that our best work is prevention. We provide um, home-based services to young parents um, through the Healthy Families model. Um, so we go in and work with, um, children, with parents who have first-time kids under the age of three and they're under the age of, of 20. Um, we also provide behavioral health services across the state, primarily um, children who have been traumatized by neglect um, or abuse or victims of or witnesses to community violence. Um, and we also provide support to the more than 5,000 individuals who are foster parents here in Massachusetts. Um, we help um, train foster parents, recruit foster parents, and then support them um, as they care for the Commonwealth's children. Um, and in addition, the representative mentioned, um, MSPCC is really proud to be an advocacy organization. We take what we learn in the field um, and really try to impact state policy. And in the behavioral health space, we do that through the Children's Mental Health Campaign. We are one of six uh, leadership agencies um, that really work to reform um, and impact 
behavioral health services here in the Commonwealth. And in addition to MSPCC, Boston Children's Hospital, Mass Association for Mental Health, Healthcare for All, Health Law Advocates, and PAL um, are my, my colleagues um, in that venture. And we are very fortunate, again, to have the representative on our side. So it's interesting, COVID has completely turned the world upside down. And like so many things um, that are disruptive and chaotic, it has its biggest impact on kids. Um, when this first happened, and, and I'd say one of the biggest areas that we saw, and it kind of picks up a little bit on both what Alice and Meredith talked about, is our work with parents. So you both did so wonderfully talking about what you can do to work with kids. We really feel that when you work with a child, you're doing it in the context of a family. And so our ability to really reach out to parents and talk to them about how they take care of themselves and also how they acknowledge and, and talk to their children about what's going on and acknowledge their own fears, their own frustrations. I mean, I don't even have little kids, but my poor husband, I've snapped at him because the dishes weren't done exactly the way they should have been. But it's that little things that when it happens, your ability to, to turn and say to a child, you know, I, this is hard for me yeah. too, um, is really important. So when we're working at MSPCC with primarily younger parents who are already isolated, marginalized, and now we tell them that they are also going to be socially isolated, our first steps was really providing basic needs for these families. Um, they didn't have diapers, they didn't have wipes, they didn't have food. So we, like a whole lot of other agencies in the Commonwealth, turned into getting real basic needs to families because we know we can't help them with anything else that they're worried about their family and they're worried about their needs for their kids. Um, after that, it really was trying to reinforce um, their informal networks, right? You know, you can't see people but how can you continue to connect with people? And how do you make those friends? How do you talk with families? So that individuals really were able to, or families, young moms, young teens, uh, were able to have the supports that we all need during a regular day, never to mind a pandemic. In terms of straight behavioral health, um, the, the children we see have been significantly traumatized and long before this had some real struggles in terms of school. And so when I think about one area we haven't talked about, it's that on March 15th, schools shut down. And so for those children who are already struggling with behavioral health issues, they lost access to structure, they lost access to teachers, they lost socialization, and in many cases, services. So I really, really worry about them at home. We've been very, we're really fortunate um, that very quickly on, a, on sort of a drop of the dime, the state worked hard to support our organization and others across the state around virtual health, um, providing behavioral health services virtually, which I think six months ago, we would all say couldn't be done. Um, so that's been a really good learning lesson that it can be done and it can be effective and has some really positive benefits. We've seen wait lists shrink, we see people being able to get to our services. So for those who it works for, it works really, really well. But for those who perhaps English isn't their first language, that technology is, is a challenge or not available. Um, for some children, really young children, providing that service virtually is challenging. Um, so I think, you know, I think virtual will always be part of our toolbox, but we really do need to sort of get back to seeing kids face to face. And you mentioned the child welfare issue. That's absolutely huge. You know, in those first few weeks when the pandemic first hit, we did see more than a 50% drop um, in the filings of 51As, primarily because kids were not in school. Um, that's really obviously very concerning. I believe that the, the department has begun to see it creep back up. So it is going back to a different level, um, but we're worried about what's gonna happen in the fall. You know, what are we gonna, what are these kids gonna come into? And, and I agree, it doesn't, mean it has to happen. It means we need to invest in those type of services now, today, and in the future so that as we go through the summer, the fall is not walking off the cliff the way we all fear it's going to be. Thank you, Mary. I mean, I think, um, you know, I'm certainly sounding the alarm that, you know, even level funding will be seen as a cut when it comes to behavioral health and mental health. And I, and I worry that none of this is free from cuts because we're $7 billion at the moment in the whole, right, as a deficit that we're looking at. But that if we don't actually increase investment for behavioral health needs for everybody, and especially children, 
it will be that much more costly in lives. So whether somebody dies of COVID or they die of addiction, overdose, or suicide, it's, it's the loss of life. I'm gonna go to more questions that people have. I'm gonna come to you, Alice, with more questions. So some of the questions I'm asking are, um, and, and I'll put a couple of questions out there and I'm just gonna let you guys jump in so we can try to get a lot of questions. Um, how do we know, how, how, how can I tell when it's time to seek um, professional support and treatment for my kid? Um, what can I do? Um, how, how, again, the question of how worried about getting them off gaming keeps coming up and I think that there's more answers to that. Um, I think it's important to empower parents to not, you know, beat themselves up and worry about, you know, long-term impact. Like we're all gonna be long-term impacted by this, right? That, that's just, this has changed us. So just accept that. And I think Alice, you can speak a little bit too, you know, it's gonna change us, but we have the opportunity to make sure that it can change us and, and help us become more resilient. Some of the other questions people are having, what has been the impact of homeschooling on children? How do we prepare children for what the fall looks like when we don't know what the fall looks like? And what can we do over the summer um, to help support children? And remember, we're talking about an, a range of ages here, Alice. So I think that um, while we have all been impacted, kids are very resilient and kids will generally take their cues from their parents. So if, you're, if you freak out in front of your kid, which I have several times, I think it's important to stop and reset right in front of your kid and say, oh my God, this is one of those moments. I'm super frustrated because I can't fix the sink. And I'm gonna stop and take a few deep breaths and model for your child what it means to reset because we're very fragile right now, all of us. What, the question about when to worry is such a funny question because as a parent, there's a part of me that's worried all the time. <laughs> like, so how bad would it have to be for me to like worry with a capital W? If, if, I, if my child won't check in with me over more and more periods of time and they won't go for a ride in the car with me and they lose interest in things like cooking or things they were doing that were making them feel good. If you see a sudden change in behavior that's sustained. So not just a tantrum because, you know, I, I actually don't blame children for tantruming on a regular basis because this is just too hard. And how else do you release that energy? The hard part about that is that kids generally release that energy at their parents. So it isn't like, oh, you were tantruming because you couldn't fix the sink, but I'm tantruming because I have an idiot for a parent, right? It feels very different when you're enduring it as a parent. And I would take those messages of emotional communication as a postcard from your kid about a feeling that they're having and not about you, not about you. But really, what is this, what is my kid trying to tell me? Like some kids are getting more depressed now because they waited so long for something to happen and, and now we're just still waiting and nothing much has changed. And so it feels like, oh, this will never end. As adults, we can do something that most kids can't. We can pivot in a moment of frustration to empathy and compassion, right? If you've been super frustrated with your kid and you're kind of mad at them, but then all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, this is so hard, I love you so much. We can pivot. Kids, their brains are not as developed, so they can't pivot. So the only way they have of letting us know how they feel sometimes is with maladaptive coping mechanisms or behavior that's incredibly annoying. And that behavior is designed to send a message to us as a parent. And the only message it's designed to send is, I need you right now, and I don't know how else to engage with you. So I pick this way because I know you're gonna be annoyed and I'll have you, definitely. I want parents to, to realize that the resilience in children comes from three things. It comes, number one, from relationships with multiple adults. We lost that when we lost school. And so now the multiple adults are the parents and that's tough. The second part of resilience that's really important is self-regulation. People who can manage their emotions tend to be more resilient, but kids are just learning this. So what can we do? We can game it. We can say strong feeling alert. Moose head, we can um, name it for people. This is a time when people have big feelings. We can model having big feelings. We can 
encourage our kids to stay in connection with us. So the third thing that is a factor of resilience, which is extremely compromised by the pandemic, is future-oriented thinking. When kids can think about, oh, next year I'm in third grade, or I'm going to do this, that's a big piece of resilience. And if you don't know what's coming, it's awfully hard to plan for yourself, like, oh, I'm going to think about this in my future. And that is sad. And so I think we have to recognize with kids that there are things that are happening right now that have been sad. Not graduating from high school or not finishing your sixth grade year and now feeling like you're a seventh grader, but you're not ready. These are real. And we can just say to kids, yes, this is real and it's hard and you're so smart to name it in this way. And we're going to get through it. We're going to get through it. You know, I want to remind parents that you have surmounted countless challenges in your life, countless challenges. And kids have survived countless challenges. Remember watching your kid learn how to walk and they just fell and fell and fell and fell. They didn't even care. They just got up again. So we, we have the human skill to get through this time in, with grace and dignity if, if we just continue to ring that Buddhist gong of relationship. Just keep checking in and naming things for kids so that they're not feeling like the narrative of the story of what's happening is not controlled by CNN. It's controlled by my mom and my caregivers. That's who tell, that's where I get my truth and I trust it. Thank you, Alice. Um, I mean, one of the things I do as a parent that um, with lots of support from other adults over, over the years is I remind myself that kids really are doing the best they can. Right. So in those hardest moments when my, when my child is so angry at me, I remind myself on a good day, they really are showing me that they're in pain. They are doing the best they can. And then I have to dig deeper when possible. And it's not always possible for me, but when possible, dig deeper to say, okay, I'm going to try to absorb some of this for you. Or I hear you. This is hard. I'm not going to be talked to like that way because it's hard for me too. And I'm going to go take a break and then I'll come back. Exactly. Just um, so, Dr. Gassner, I have another question about um, what are some um, strategies for helping children who really are grieving? And I think it's important to recognize children are grieving the loss of friendships, the loss of school, the loss of freedom, the loss of life and play as they knew it. But also in this time, in the um, what we are finally seems to be a reckoning of white supremacy and racism in this country. And where we're seeing that this pandemic has absolutely ripped away any false sense that like we take care of everybody, right? Immigrants in our communities are, we, we've seen this pandemic is hitting them so much harder. Um, for those who have the least resources and are the least secure politically, they have been hit the hardest. And so I just think of children who are grieving in a variety of ways or um, have also lost loved ones because of this. Um, and depending on your socioeconomic place right now, you probably, you have a higher chance of maybe also knowing somebody who has been impacted by this. So I guess asking you about what are some of those strategies? And then there's another question here that says, will support for children in hospital settings change due to the pandemic? Okay, those are, those are two big questions. Uh, I think regarding the first point, I would just mention grieving looks differently in kids. And it depends on the child as well. And I think that that's something that, especially right now, I found a lot of parents are struggling with. Oh, my child doesn't look depressed. They're not sad. Um, now, as well as at any time, it's a good reminder to just say child's, childhood depression, whether there are three or 10 or even sometimes 17 or sometimes as adults, it may not look like traditional depression where you expect someone to be really sad or tearful. Um, and that is something that certainly can be seen and, and we have seen it. But a lot of times in small kids, especially with this kind of concurrent trauma that's kind of circling everywhere, um, you see a lot more irritability and aggression. And that's something that I think, again, like parents take, it's hard not to take that personally. It's hard not to take it personally when your child is throwing things at you or you tell them to go do something and they're like, absolutely not, or they break curfew. And so I think that, again, kind of circling even to the first point that, you know, when behavior changes in that way, even if it looks kind of on the front oppositional, recognizing that it may in fact not just be 
oppositional and there may be something behind it more like grieving and grieving the loss of whether it be a family member or a loved one or or just as you said like the loss of graduation and normalcy and that's something that really I think it's almost very hard for most kids to articulate that that is something that can be grieved. I mean, so normalcy, I mean, I barely can kind of articulate what normalcy should be or what a normal life should look like, but what the life that we all knew is now different. And I think all of us have had to grieve in some way. And I think teenagers really struggle in trying to say, you know, what it is specifically. And, and it probably just isn't one thing. It's many, many things um, that they're really struggling with kind of letting go. And so I really caution parents to be on the lookout for that and see it more as a reflection of kind of mood symptoms and depression and potentially a depressive disorder. Um, what do they do? We're, we're, I mean, I think it's important to help, you know, while things have been closed down and hospitals have been closed down, we're reopening, right? And certainly mm -hmm. organizations like Mary and the CHA and, and elsewhere, help is still available. Yeah. Right? yeah. So where does a parent go if they even want to just assess? I, I don't know if I need help. I mean, my kid's been angry for three months, but why wouldn't they be angry? Well, right. how do I know when we've crossed that line? Right. Um, what would be the first steps for parents in trying to figure out, you know, assessing and getting support around this? I mean, it very much, I think, depends on kind of the urgency of the situation. I mean, certainly if it's at the point where kids are really not behaving at all the same way that they used to such that they're not eating or not sleeping. I mean, those are huge warning signs, obviously. And then things like suicidal ideation or extreme aggression. Um, those are big, big red flags of, I would get your child to an emergency room for an assessment um, first and foremost. And obviously inpatient units, hospitals are not going to close and we still offer services and we still offer therapy and they look a little different. The services look different than they did before, but um, they're all still there. Um, but even still in, in outpatient clinics, Cambridge is seeing new intakes. Um, we had a little bit of a brief uh, hiatus where we just kind of had to figure out how to transition to virtual, but we're seeing new intakes there. Um, and a lot of clinics have started to see intakes. Still many are virtual and many services are virtual. Um, a lot of like the in-home services are still virtual that we recommend that a lot of our children with mass health seek out. Um, but, the, and I think, um, Mary, you mentioned the excellent point that some kids don't quite take to virtual services very well, especially little ones with attention issues, um, which again can easily be worsened by the COVID pandemic and all the other stressors. Um, but, but also maybe calling your pediatrician, right? A lot of our, in Cambridge, we're really fortunate that we have more of an integrative model um, in some of our clinics around, um, you know, mental health support. Not everything is going to lead to the psych emergency, yes. right? right? Yes. And so just trying to get an assessment, right? Call your pediatrician. This is what's mm -hmm. happening. And um, I, I think just encouraging parents that, you know, they don't have to wait until it's an emergency. Alice Cohen is great. She says, often we pathologize, pathologize children and we wait, you know, while they're telling us every day that they're in pain, and this isn't a pre-pandemic life, while we're waiting for, while every day they tell us in pain and they're very patient, they will keep telling us over and over that they're struggling um, until we have, but then we wait until they're in this moment of crisis when to recognize that in fact, they were telling us the truth all along. I just want you to imagine you went to the doctor for a physical and the doctor said to you, uh, Mary, you, you have cancer, but it's very small. So we're not gonna do anything about it. We're gonna wait for it to get really big and dangerous. And then we're gonna, and this is how we are with kids' mental health. We, we, we create the conditions in which we make the struggle harder for them. If you are concerned about your kid and your kid shares with you that they also feel concerned, just call your pediatrician. If you're super worried, you can go to the ED. There's still mental health people in the ED. Yep. And you don't always have to come into the hospital. Let me just say that certainly. I didn't know that. See, that's new. Yeah. You can just go there for an assessment. Um, I mean, we are, we obviously, I know there are risks of going to the emergency room now, but um, plenty of psychiatrists are still available in emergency rooms just to do an assessment and get people connected with services or just provide insights and recommendations surrounding that. So parents really shouldn't be worrying alone. Um, if you. I may, Mary, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, was, I was just going to say there's a great online resource um, that actually was previewed or, or featured just as all of this um, started to unroll. So it's called Network of Care Massachusetts, www.massachusetts.networkofcare.org. And it is an online, in time, real time 
um, resource that you can find um, behavioral health services across the state. Um, and it's, I, you know, shout out to MAMH, uh, which really worked um, to pull this together. It's a great resource. I encourage people to, to look for it and you know, check it out if they really need services. Mary, what are some of the tools that you are seeing that are helpful for parents and providers, right? I mean, I think this is such a hard time and it's this balance between letting parents also just cut themselves a break, right? Yeah. When, when you, you know, I, I know that for all of the needs that my kids are showing me right now, I, I can't provide, I can't be there every minute of it, right? Yeah. And one of the things that I know that you do is that you, prevention is really important. And I think when parents have expectations that they can't meet, you know, intuitively, I think that that contributes to their own sense of failure and anger, which can then also contribute to lashing out and to cruelty to children. Um, what is some of the advice and some of the tools that you have for parents? And I'll just say quickly, um, Rick Weisford, who lives in Cambridge, he and I had a conversation well before I had kids and I was doing this work. He said, you know, Marjorie, I know people tell people they should, kids shouldn't have too much TV. And he said, I'm not convinced that too much TV is always bad. He said, sometimes I think actually too much TV for some families means um, that um, maybe there's the less chance of a child actually being hurt by a parent who's really stressed out at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just something that has stuck with me. And I think about what you're doing to help providers and caregivers um, who, who ultimately, you know, most people want to be kind and loving towards their children. And then you know, cross that line. You're right. You're absolutely, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, today's the day I'm going to hurt my kid. And so every parent, I believe, wants to be the very best parent they can be. But we know that stressors impact it. In fact, children who <laughs> are in poverty are 22 times more likely to be neglected and abused than a child who doesn't. And again, that doesn't mean people who are poor are bad people. It just means that they are living under an incredible stress. And you add a pandemic when you start and you start thinking about unemployment and not being able to meet the needs, not being able to see people. Those are all factors that contribute um, to putting a child at risk. So what have we been doing? You know, again, contact, 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 reaching out, calling, connecting. You know, we've shown up at the front door and just gone for a not even a virtual walk, a, a social distance walk with, with a parent, just to sort of make sure that they know folks are still there. Um, we've encouraged parents to how to keep, connect with your child. So this it was an opportunity to do things with your child. How do you do them if you can't go to the zoo or you can't go on the tea, you know, really getting down and, and sometimes our staff are doing it virtually. So they're, they have a game of shoots and ladder. We have a game of shoots and ladder and we're playing with them and their child, really trying to help them connect connect with their child during times like this. So many of the families that we work with never experienced that as a child. They didn't have their, that relationship with their parents. They don't know how to play with kids. So it really is a lot of hands-on walking through, not assuming anything. And to your point, Representative, not making the goals too big. It's not about getting to the end of the month. Or the, it's, it's what are we going to do today? What's a good day look like? Hour by hour. <laughs> yes, and aren't you lucky that you know that, but for somebody who's never been told that and who is constantly questioning whether they're a good parent, to be able to say, what are we going to do today? So in the morning, it's let's let's do this. And then we, we can have some downtime. And maybe that is watching TV or maybe that's doing a puzzle, but giving giving some sort of a structure to a day so a young parent really is able to know this is how I'm going to get through it. And it may not always work when we spend a lot of time that may not reach that goal. There may be a blowout or a, and how do you pause, reset, and say, okay, well, now we'll do this. Um, it's, it's a lot of hands-on work. And these are, these are, again, for the families that we're working with, often parents, young parents, who just haven't had that kind of role model. Yeah, and I think that idea that you say that it's, you know, it may not work. You know, I think if I've come to learn anything as a parent, um, I, I've got to try it many, many different times, different time of day, different day of the week, uh, you know, and it's about like going back to it and knowing that just because it doesn't work today doesn't mean you won't get there. Um, but I do think it's important that parents are, you know, there's, there's that article in the New York Times that talked about parents being um, burned out, right? A burnout syndrome of parents where they just completely disengage. And, um, you know, I, I think we are in these unprecedented times of being in this like pressure cooker with each other. And um, I, my kid has had more video time than I ever thought that I would give him. And we're constantly 
today I gave in. Today I was the parent who said, you won. You had eight hours on, on. and I'm not happy about it, but I can't change that. I needed to get work done. You need it to be occupied. Um, next day, today's a different day. Just know that. And, and so, you know, even those mixed messages, just but every day I think, you know, parents are also doing the best they can, um, need to cut themselves some slack, um, and but also reach out for help. Alice? Marjorie, I don't think that is a mixed message. I think it's a very clear message that says we do what we need to do to get through the day and days are different and we are flexible and flexible people cope well. So, you know, my I have been doing trainings in the morning and afternoon for the last five days in my kitchen and I have two children and they have learned how to sneak in and out of the kitchen without disrupting the audio. Is that neglectful or bad? No, it's adaptive. So if your kid needs video games one day because you need something, but the next day you have time to play a game, that's just adaptive. It's not a mixed message. We need to remember that your kid's relationship with you as a parent, that's the most sacred relationship they're ever going to have. That's, you can't wreck it. All you got to do is be good enough. Got to be good enough. So Yes, you, of course you can't hurt your kid, but having inconsistencies in your daily routine is not going to hurt your kid. What hurts our kids is the feeling of banishment and rejection they get when we're unable to cope with them. Yeah. I don't know how you were punished as a child. Some people got smacked in the head. The most difficult punishment for children is the severance of the relationship. It's the go to your room thing. And now you've lost, you've had an interruption of your primary attachment. And it's incumbent on the grown up in those situations to go get the kid. Yeah. It's not incumbent on the kid to creep down into the kitchen 45 minutes later and peek around and wait to see if you have the right expression on your face so they can come back in. We have to make the connection and keep the connection. But it's okay if the, if the connection is tenuous sometimes, it, that makes us stronger. The most important part is the return. Mm -hmm. It's the return. I got mad, you got mad, what's the return? And I think parents forget too, how powerful they are in these little interactions mm -hmm. they have with kids, especially young kids be like, oh, I see you like working right now doing this thing. I, I like that. Those pieces of praise are hugely important to kids. And when we're stressed, we, we don't praise as much. I would tell you to, Five, catch your kid being good five times a day and really sing a song about it because that'll keep you connected. Yeah. No, I, I as I said, I could listen to Alice all day. Um, and, you know, I, I asked both of you, um, uh, Mary and, and, and Dr. Gansner, one of the things that we're thinking about is the fall, right? And I see it in terms of I'm looking at my kids and I'm talking to parents around the community. Um, Anxiety has built up for different kids in different ways. Families have very different interpretations of what moving safely through this pandemic looks like. And, and I'm not sure that class um, and race are having an impact on that. I think it's, I'm seeing it all over in very different communities where people are interpreting what distance looks like, what it means to feel comfortable taking a mask off of people who they don't live with. Um, one of the things our kids keep saying, you know, they'll see people who don't have masks and we're having to find ways that aren't shaming, but are saying, well, we're remembering why we do this. And, and we want, and we don't know that they don't have a good reason. Um, and we hope that people who can do this are doing this, right? So, so part of that, but I think about what the fall looks like. And I think about separation anxiety for kids and for families. And uh, you know, the other issue that we, we don't even know is, and this is my job as a, as a legislator, is for parents who might be forced to choose between keeping their kids safe when there may not be school uh, school versus also having a job. So those are bigger policy issues I'm working on, but I think about what can parents be doing over the summer to prepare for what this might look, I mean, assuming there will be some version, I'd say 70% 70, 70 chance the schools may try to bring some kids at some point into a building. Have, we haven't been told how they're gonna do that, quite honestly, or how they're gonna pay for that. and. That, 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 those are some issues I'm taking on as a legislator, but it's going to happen and the world is reopening, right? So parents are starting to go out to stores and, you know, I know my own kids will say, I can't believe that they like, you handed something to someone. I'm like, well, I had, you know, 
I, I gave it to them and I stepped back and I had masks on, but kids are confused. They're really confused about what these public health protocols have meant from stay at home, don't touch anyone or look at anyone to where we are now and, and how to do this choreographing dance of what we are seeing as public health protocols. I mean, I'd love to hear from both of you, both sort of, you know, what's your advice around parents as they have to help parent, kids think through these things and, um, and what they can do to prepare. That's a, a good question. Um, I mean, it's almost impossible to prepare for something that we don't actually know it is going to happen and what exactly it will look like when it does or if it does happen. Um, I mean, I think even in the healthcare setting, I know there's a strong attempt to try and prepare for the second wave, make sure we have enough beds. Um, but things didn't happen or at all this time, like we even predicted that they would with all of the models. So it's it's hard to plan that far out in the future. And I know, I think, oh, okay, just naming the uncertainty um, is huge. Just we don't know. And I think, you know, the more we try to over plan, I think we risk making kids very anxious, even more anxious. And I think it's important to to model for our kids, like representative, as you said, with your, with you, you know, touch somebody's hand or forget to sanitize to, to not, you know, beat up on ourselves or get overly anxious about it. And just, you know, accept the fact that we're all going to make mistakes in, in this. We're going to, at times, like I've recently forgot to sanitize my hands coming out of the building at work one day and you know I got into my car and was like oh no I forget we're gonna make mistakes it's so much to adjust to um but I've been trying to model as well for my daughter just oh that's right like because my mom my my mom taught me how to kind of hand sanitize when I was younger and now I've been trying to teach her and now it's way more than I ever thought she would ever have to learn how to hand sanitize so I'm really conscious of trying not to have her be overly anxious and overly worried and overly concerned. And she's, just, you know, she's especially young. And I think this is different for a teenager than a small child. Um, but I, I still want her to have some sense that, you know, it's okay that, you know, we will make mistakes, but it'll be okay. And I mean, obviously we can't speak about that in the global sense, but, but at least she knows, you know, mom and dad right now are here, our family's here, we love her and we're gonna, we'll make it through. And I think that's, we're really trying to get some structure in now. I know this is my own personal kind of day-to-day -day routine, but I think it works for a lot of families of trying to insert during the day periods of time where it's just kind of the two of us and, and or the three of us, if we can rope in my husband, um, to break up that kind of tension in the day where she's doing other things. And I think it, kids are at risk of kind of feeling left behind and anxious. And that's where that kind of screen time can start increasing and getting more and more anxious. Um, so I think the more that parents can have some as best as they can kind of just like coping skills in their pocket or like tricks in their pocket of things that kind of help break up the monotony of the day if this happens again. I know my husband and I are like, we need to make sure that we have a period of time just to check in with Flo and our daughter during the day. And I know I recommend that to a lot of the, the kids on the unit as well, that the parents, even if they're working from home, um, find a way just to kind of check in and be with their kid and kind of re hopefully relieve that anxiety for just a little period of time. Thank you. I, I think the Go only ahead, thing Sarah. I'd add to that is um, really to, to underscore to our children that when, and I hope it's when, uh, we go back to school, it will be done in a way that's safe, that's thoughtful, that takes it into consideration. I think it's really important that we let them know people are planning for this, even if we don't know exactly what it's going to look like, because I believe, I believe, I agree with you, Meredith, but I think we have to constantly say that teachers and your parents and your community are working to make it safe um, so that when they go back to school, they have a comfort level. And, and you know, I, I saw the Globe today, I think it was almost like 50-50 that, you know, some parents are saying they don't think they're going to be comfortable and some think they would be. Um, and, and my children are grown up, so I, I don't have this issue. But um, I spend a lot of time hoping that as people think about it, it's, it's when kids go back to school and not if kids go back to school. You know, we talked about it earlier about the eyes on just in terms of child protection safety, but there is, and, and clearly academics. I mean, think about the slippage that happens during a normal summer. Summer has, there's going to be six months this year. So, you know, any child, your, your, you know, your child who, who enjoys and is doing well in school, but for those kids who have disabilities or behavioral health issues, you know, I, I worry that was already a big gap is going to be greater. Um, but also, it's just really social and emotional learning. These 
these kids need to be around other children. They need the, the structure. And I actually think we need to be thinking, and, and I guess I am putting my policy and your policy hat on, how do we support teachers when these kids come back to school? You know, they're gonna have a classroom of children who we don't know what's gone on over the course of the last six months. You know, it could have been a day full of too much TV or doing puzzles, or it could have been a mom who was taking care of a dad who was who died of COVID. Um, and it's going to be the range. So um, I, I think the challenges are going to be great. I, I agree, we, we, you know, we can we can plan for them and we can get ready for them. It's gonna be an investment, but I think it's not only our, how do we prepare our children, but how do we prepare our teachers? Because um, we know distance learning was done all over the map before all of this behavioral health services were up and down across our state. We need to make sure that teachers are ready for this. Thank you, Mary. Yes. Um, yeah, um, I, I will just say to those you watching, you know, part of the work I do as a legislator is we are um, in the process of bringing health and human services together and the Department of Education together, myself and the chair of education in the house, because we are trying to break down some of the silos of how we support children's mental health and behavioral health, um, knowing that the schools are going to be receiving a lot and knowing that our educators are going to be bringing in their own experiences. Um, and I think many were traumatized in not knowing how to carry out. I mean, teachers were, from my blunt point of view, because I'm the elected official, is teachers were thrown to the wind to figure it out themselves. And, and some did better than others and others didn't know what to do. And, uh, and families were left to figure it out for themselves. And that can't be what happens in the fall, right? Um, so we have just about two minutes left. Is there anything else that you know each of you would want to say? You have about 30 seconds. Um, although I could sit here now and listen to all three of you all day, because I think one is on a video game and one's outside. So um, any parting words of wisdom? I'm going to say a few things, and then you jump in. One, I think for parents who are watching this, please know that there, there is, there's support out there whether it's acute, whether you're worried about moving into a place of acute crisis with your child, or you just want some help and some coaching, um, there is help out there. And so we will be sending out in my email every night. If you're on my email list, we will continue to send out resources. Call your pediatrician. Um, you know, there's resources out there for you. So please use them. Um, I think to parents out there, I wanna say, this is really hard. And as a parent, I, I just wanna like, you know, do a group universal hug for parents that we're all doing the best we can. And I, I did have somebody what very wise to me say many years ago, sometimes good enough is good enough. Um, and as someone who, who aspired to be a perfectionist, and I was reminded I didn't understand what that meant, um, good enough has to be good enough. And, um, you know, it's hour by hour in our house, even though we try to have a schedule, but, you know, we are, um, we do, we, 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 at the end of the day, there's no choice but to figure this out and go back and try over. Um, I don't know, Alice, any parting like wisdom that you yes. want? You always have wisdom with me, so. So here's what I wanna say, it's very serious. Your relationships with your kids are still intact. Everything is still intact. Even if it feels far away, you can go back and find it. It's not gone. Pick a place in your house where you can take a break. It might be on your front porch. You might have a special window that you open. You take some breaths. You might be standing in front of the freezer because it's so hot. But just pick a place in your house where you can take a break, your, a break, your personal timeout space. And don't be shy about using it. And if you're doing it like in front of your kids, say, listen, you have Cupcake the teddy bear. I have in front of the freezer. So this is how we cope. Just continue to cope. And my last thing would be like, try, try, try to safely go outside. The natural world is very healing right now. Try to go outside and just look around like your yard, you know, if you if it feels safe enough. Okay. Thank you. Seconds. And I also wanted to say to parents who are watching this, um, you know, I think this is hard for everybody, but for parents who are struggling to figure out how to put food on their table, for parents who are struggling uh, and how to acknowledge that they may be sick and have mixed immigrant status in their families, if they're struggling with having to go to work and leaving children at home. Um, I wanna acknowledge that this is a lot harder for you than others, right? So the level, everyone's suffering, but the level of suffering is not equal. And the shame is on our society, not on you. 
uh, I think about being a child who grew up in poverty in public housing in Cambridge, and I think about my incredibly strong, resilient mom who was watching this and now getting teary-eyed. Um, she couldn't have worked any harder than she did, and she couldn't have loved us any harder. Now put a pandemic on this, and I just can't imagine the incredible pain that that would have added to. So to all the moms and dads and grandparents out there and caregivers who are suffering more because of the racist and classist nature of our society, um, we as a society have made this harder for you. And so whatever we can do um, as your neighbors, as your elected officials, as your healthcare providers, as your advocates, as your educators, um, it is on us to support you not for you to feel that you can't ask for that help because our failure is not having you have the basic needs of what you need and having to struggle too hard anyway. So um, to all of my panelists who are um, here, thank you so much for all the work that you do. You are holding the hearts of children across our community um, and, and our state and really providing parents with the resiliency that they have inside of them and the tools that they need. We all need help. We just need, some of us need more help on a different day. Um, to CCTV, my, my undying gratitude for all that you do in making this possible and making it possible to us to, to be separate and yet still connected. Um, to my staff, I wanna say special thanks to, to Awkwardy and to Alicia. Thank you so much for helping prepare this. And um, do not hesitate. Um, we are going to be reevaluating how many more of these we did, we're gonna do. We've done 13 in a row. Um, and just if you're on my email list, you know we've done an email every single night for almost four, more, four months. We will be reducing that to Monday through Friday. It's time for our staff also to go outside and take some fresh air on the weekends. Um, and so we will do a couple more of these town halls and, and we may take a break and come back to them, but um, don't hesitate to reach out if there's a topic you would like to see us explore. And I wish you all um, to be as well as you possibly can be today. And thank you for doing everything you can to help ensure that we as a community are safe. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. I thank mean, Representative guys. Decker. It was really great to meet all of you. I, it was really super fun. Thank Mary, you. I wanted to meet you for so long. Oh, <laughs> right back at you. <laughs> email you so you have each other's emails. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mary.